Welcome to the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar is entitled Evaluating a Course on Implicit Bias in Clinical and Learning Environments, Provider Bias Awareness, Patient-Centeredness, and Reflections. And it was presented by Janice Saban, along with our guest moderator, Bianca Frogner, on June 24, 2021. Uh, my name is David Armstrong, and I'm the director of the Health Workforce Tactical Assistance Center. And welcome to our webinar series. Uh, this particular event is the third in a series which is focused on health equity. And it is entitled Evaluating a Course on Implicit Bias in Clinical and Learning Environments, Provider Bio -aware, Bias Awareness, Patient Centeredness, and Reflections. And for those of you who missed the other webinars in this series or are interested in other webinars we've conducted in the past, by all means, check us out on healthworkforceta.org. I'm gonna go ahead and turn the event over to our guest moderator, Bianca Frogner. Bianca is the director of the Center for Health Workforce Studies located at the University of Washington School of Medicine. Bianca, would you like to introduce our speaker? Thank you so much, David, and thank you for having us today. Uh, as David mentioned, I'm the director of the Center for Health Workforce Studies here at University of Washington in Seattle. And today you'll be hearing from one of our fabulous investigators who's leading a study for us, uh, or has been leading a series of studies actually really for us um, it, around this topic of implicit bias. We're really lucky to have uh, one of the pioneers in this field, Janice Sabin. Uh, Janice is a research associate professor in also in the School of Medicine here at UW uh, within the Department of Biomedical Informatics and Medical Education. She's also an adjunct uh, research associate professor in the School of Social Work and affiliated with the UW office, of, uh, UW Medicine's Office of Healthcare Equity. Uh, so I don't want to take too much time away from her. Uh, I just want to point out that this work is uh, one of our HRSA funded uh, projects that are under our Health Workforce Research Center focused on health equity. So I'll sh uh, hand it over to Janice uh, and then I'll come back here to uh, help facilitate the Q&A. So if you want to go ahead and share your screen, Janice, that'd be great. So thank you so much, uh, David and Bianca. Um, Again, I'm gonna to talk today about evaluating a course on implicit bias in the clinical learn and learning environment and then the outcome measures of provider bias awareness, patient-centeredness and reflections uh, that we gathered in our data collection. First, I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the land on which the University of Washington occupies as the traditional home of the Tulalip, Muckleshoot, Duwamish and Suquamish tribal nations. Without them, we wouldn't have access to this healing, working, teaching, and learning environment. We humbly take the opportunity to thank the original caretakers of this land who are still here. So uh, we were very fortunate to uh, receive funding to evaluate this course. This course had been already developed. And um, when I came into the center, uh, just thrilled that we got to do an in-depth evaluation. And these are the members of our team. We had a great team working on this project. And before I get deeply into um, the topic that I'm talking about, which is at the individual level, I want to situate it into sort of this macro level system and uh, define structural racism and thinking about working at the individual level, but also always being aware of the larger, you know, macro level issues in institutions um, and society. So structural racism is defined as the macro level systems, the societal forces, institutions, ideologies, policies, and processes that all interact with one another to generate and reinforce inequities among racial and ethnic groups. Okay, and then just to define implicit bias, and these are attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, decision-making, and behavior without our even realizing it. And I could talk about this for a couple of hours, but we'll just sort of leave it at that. And I'm sure many of you have done work on implicit bias and um, kind of know how it operates in our healthcare system. So the course that we are talking about, Implicit Bias in the Clinical and Learning Environment, it was developed um, in 2017 with a large team of people uh, at the University of Washington School of Medicine Center for Health Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And this included many stakeholders, 
um, including across our five state region. So rural area deans and preceptors. And it was specifically for faculty who teach and was really spurred on by students wanting the faculty that they interact with and preceptors out in the field to have some kind of standard um, level of knowledge about uh, implicit bias and social determinants of health. And our learning objectives were to increase awareness of implicit bias, understand how bias manifests in patient care and teaching, and learn ways to mitigate bias in teaching and clinical care. And to date, we have about 2,000 people in the School of Medicine who are faculty who teach or precept and who have taken this course. And when we were developing, the considerations were that it must be brief. So every minute of the course counted. It ended up being 35 minutes. And we needed to develop a flow from the history of racism to social determinants of health to implicit bias and how to mitigate the impact of bias in teaching practice at the individual level as well as the organizational level. So it was a tall order uh, developing this course. When we had the opportunity to study it further and in depth through HRSA, we wanted to evaluate it with a national sample and we chose primary care providers and uh, ED uh, physicians and other pri providers um, in the ED in academic medical centers. And our research questions were pretty simple. Does completing the course increase bias awareness, improve patient-centered communication, and stimulate reflection on teaching and practice? And then we collected measures of um, bias, personal characteristics, and provider uh, practice characteristics, and were the strength of any of these or any of these characteristics associated with bias awareness, patient-centered communication, and reflections on teaching and practice. So our sample ended up being 114 uh, providers, and data collection, I'm mentioning this because it is important, ended December 31st, 2019. So this was before all the events that unfolded in the year 2020. And we had 57% were MDs, 21% NPs. There were only four PAs. 70% um, were female, 73% white. Majority were under the age of 50. 73% were in academic healthcare systems. Um, uh, there were, you know, other systems people uh, enrolled from. The South was overrepresented, 40% were from the South. And then 67% reported having continuing education on working with diverse populations um, in the past year and 45% similar for gender equity. And we took measures of implicit bias. We didn't give people feedback on their implicit bias scores. We used the implicit association test. And if you will just look at the column on the right, Cohen's D, which is an effect size measure. On the race IAT for race implicit bias, there was a moderate uh, level or degree among our participants. Implicit gender bias was very strong among all participants, regardless of personal characteristics. Now, explicit race bias, which is just how you feel and what you will report you feel, was pretty much non-existent, so it was zero. And then with the two measures of associating uh, gender with career. So um, the first one was looking at males or females being associated with career. And we found a strong association of males rather than females with career and a very uh, strong association of females with family rather than um, males. So there were biases that were implicit and some, um, explicit as well. And then the last measure was we asked people how they feel. How, my feelings towards white people are, my feelings towards black people are. And it was a scale of zero to 10 with 10 extremely warm. It's called a feeling thermometer and zero very cold. So for the most part, you know, people were very warm towards both groups, but they were significantly more warm towards black people. So one outcome measure was bias awareness, and we had an eight item scale we used, and there were three categories, personal bias, societal bias, and then bias in healthcare. So awareness of these issues. And we found <clears throat> that the brief online course increased bias awareness among healthcare providers who teach or mentor uh, significantly uh, improved after exposure to the course. Implicit and explicit attitudes, provider and practice characteristics were not associated with this increase in bias awareness. 
I had thought they might be, you know, thinking about implicit attitudes, potentially people, uh, it might impact how they interacted with the course, uh, but they were not, a, not affected. So the conclusion is the course is universally useful to increase bias awareness, regardless of, you know, the provider population, which I think is a really interesting and, and you know, kind of exciting measure, measure and outcome. So our, our next outcome measure was patient-centered communication. And again, I could talk about this for quite a while because it was a kind of a complex way to get the um, actual patient-centered communication measure, but <clears throat> we had two case vignettes that were medically equivalent. <clears throat> and we asked people to role play. So one was diabetes not controlled and one was heart failure. And they were mildly non-adherent in the um, case vignette description. And we had a uh, patient dialogue, and this was using text boxes. And we just asked after the patient said something, you know, in text, in quotes, um, the provider to say, what would you say next? And only three participants of the 114 actually came out of the role play and said, I would tell them this. Most of them said, Mr. Johnson, I would like you to do this. So it was really fascinating that they really got into this role play. And then we analyzed each response on a scale of empathy, partnering, expressing concern, and giving reassurance. And these are some of the uh, measures and components of patient-centeredness. And so we found that overall, we found a significant positive change in patient-centered communication after completing the course. So patient-centered communication improved. And we did focus on that in the course, how to communicate and as you know, kind of mitigating bias. Data analysis is still in progress on this, um, but we do know that improvement in patient-centered communication is not associated with either implicit or explicit bias. Again, so universally, people can be impacted regardless of the biases that they hold. We have found that participants who are less than 40 were had uh, greater communication increase, and then being an MD or an NP, there was more uh, you know, gains in patient-centered communication. And this course was specifically targeted to MDs or NPs. So that makes a lot of sense that they got more out of it than others. And then our last outcome measure was reflections. And basically we just asked reflecting on this course, how will the content potentially impact your teaching and your practice? And so we ranked these. Um, you know, I already do this was one of them. So we heard that, you know, it was a nice reminder that I've heard before. A moderate response, an example for teaching was it helped me reflect on my bias. I might have, but thinking that I didn't. And here's a strong detailed response. I had never heard of the concept of aversive racism. And unfortunately fear I may have some degree of this. I like to think of myself as someone with egalitarian values and now fear I may fall into this category to some extent. I also did not realize stereotypes can be contagious in both negative and positive ways. This inspires me to continuously work to be a good role model for my students and residents. So that's someone who really took a lot of the content of the course into their reflection and incorporated it. And then how would this apply to practice? The same scale we used to rank these. And one, it was mostly a review, but a good reminder. Moderate response was, I will be more cognizant of how lack of diversity in the workforce impacts care of diverse populations. And then uh, the stronger response that was very detailed, uh, continue to approach each patient as a whole person, someone whose need for healthcare guidance and treatment is only one part of their life experience. Be particularly attentive to my stress levels, rush days, times of ambiguous clinical situations to avoid giving bias inequitable care. And again, that's taking very specific parts uh, course content. So there are some limitations to this study. Simulated case vignettes don't represent real world care. Increased bias awareness does not necessarily lead to behavior change. The behaviors that were reflected were aspirational because we did this immediately following the course. There was no time for reflection or for, to actually change any behavior. And then of course, sampling bias, people who were willing to sit for an hour and fill out a survey and take IATs and uh, do a lot of complicated uh, you know, role play 
are people who are probably very interested in this topic to begin with. So our conclusions is demonstrates that healthcare providers can benefit from brief course content regardless of the degree of implicit and explicit bias and other characteristics. It's not known whether aspirational actions will result in actual change. And then future research is needed to determine whether or not there are lasting effects of a course like this. I want to acknowledge the people who helped develop the course. This course is available at this site to all for all to use. It's publicly available and um, I encourage you to check it out if you're interested. So thank you very much. And uh, we're ready for questions and comments now. Thank you so much, Janice. Um, I do see a couple questions coming in from the audience, so I'll go ahead and start with those questions. The first question that came in uh, asks, to what extent were participants aware of the nature of the study? At what point, if ever, were they informed that they were being evaluated on bias slash implicit bias? Well, you know, we had a very, um, extensive consent process. And we were very clear they would be taking some cognitive tests related to bias um, and you know, really spelled out all the measures they would take and how long the survey would be. We told them it would be 45 minutes to one hour. Um, and so they were you know, highly well-informed. And again, I think that people who put themselves in this position you know, we sent out blast emails to thousands of people to take this study, and we got 114 in like three months. So, you know, there's a lot of sampling bias going on here. There are a lot of people who wouldn't be willing to do that. Uh, we did not provide fee personal feedback on IAT scores. And in my research, I usually do not because that kind of derails the, the research process. We did provide a link to Project Implicit at Harvard site so that people could go and explore the topic as well as take IATs and get feedback for themselves if they chose to. Great, thank you, Janice. And there was a, a comment that I just wanted to uh, say that somebody was interested in getting a link to the course. And I'm just going to put that in the chat box for everybody, but um, I'm sure we're able to share some of those slides too again um, mm -hmm. for the audience to see. So that's great that there's uh, interest in um, seeing the course. So another question that came in is, did your analysis determine which specific factors of the course contributed most to the overall effectiveness, such as presentation format or the interactive components? No, we have not looked at that. Um, I'm not sure that we really uh, have set it up that we can. I uh, personally think, um, which I didn't go into great detail on our analysis, but we found that on the bias awareness scores, um, bias in healthcare, people started out very high to begin with, so very aware. So there wasn't a lot of room for improvement on that one. On um, awareness of bias in society, I think personally that we did we did a six minute segment on social determinants of health to really drive home, you know, the inequities in society. And so, you know, did it in a very evidence based way. And I think that that might have had a lot of impact. That is the score that actually drove the bias awareness increase was awareness of societal bias and then personal bias awareness did not significantly increase. So, you know, that's something that I found really interesting. And um, it was not high. People felt that they were not pretty much not biased in their uh, decision making. So, you know, that's an area of further study and maybe a lot more work to do in that area to help people kind of make that leap. It could be me. Um, Great. Well, thank you, Janice. And while we wait for some more questions that come in from the audience, I'll take the moderator's prerogative and ask you a couple questions. Um, so how does this course fit into an overall program of working to become an anti-racist organization, given that many organizations are trying to think about ways to become uh, anti-racist? Yeah, well, you know, I think one of the really interesting things when we developed this course, again, it was students who were, you know, having sort of a movement forward. And when they went out into the field, you know, across our five state region, they would find preceptors who really didn't know anything about 
social determinants. And they were very frustrated that race only came up in the context of biology. So there was a lot of, you know, uh, movement towards we need people to understand the bigger picture. And so I think this course, one of the things that it does, it fits into an overall program. And I know that most universities are now working multi-level, you know, having caucuses and, you know, doing a, a lot of work on anti-racism and reevaluating policies and putting everything through a health equity lens in order to eliminate both bias and inequities, and also taking a lot of accountability measures. But I think a course like this, how it fits in is doing, you know, kind of a standardized, very purposeful set of knowledge that people can take with them. And what we told people about this course is that all of the resources and all of the studies mentioned in this course are by top researchers across the nation and the world. And so if you have students who are asking questions and you really don't know the answers, you can direct them to the references in this course. And so it was a tool as well to help people. And I think it's one very small piece, but I think standardizing knowledge across an entire healthcare system can have a really big impact. Great, thank you, Janice. So another question came in from the audience that asks whether the race of the participants were known. So I assume those who responded. And then could you share an example of a question asked? So I'm thinking this may be um, along the lines of the case vignettes and, and kind of how maybe you elicited some of the these feelings uh, that people had towards patients. But please, uh, Sandra, if I misunderstood the second part of your question, please let me know. So what was the first part now? <laughs> the, whether the race of the participants were oh, known. Oh, yes. We did, we did know the race of the participant. And there were differences in uh, degrees of bias um, based on race, definitely. So uh, the majority of participants were white and showed moderate to strong bias, implicit bias that favored white people as did Asian participants, but African-American participants favored African-Americans implicitly. So there was a definite you know, difference. And that's pretty, you know, the results that we often see. Um, and- um, Maybe can you speak to the case vignettes piece a little bit yeah. more? Uh, Sandra said that, I, I, I guess yeah. I, I caught the question right, which is give me a little bit better sense of some okay. of the questions to elicit those responses. Okay, so you know, basically these questions were developed for another study, and it was a study done in like 2009, where we uh, developed these case vignettes, and um, we wanted them to be mildly non-adherent patients, but not overtly, and they were developed with, I think, probably four iterations of physician advisory groups. So we, um, they were really authentic type questions. And then we had a medical writer, medical technical writer, write the dialogue for patients. And then we ran this by providers and patients. So it was very, very purposeful. So we had this already developed. And so the content of it would be like Mr. Johnson, for example, would say, you know, I'm trying to take my, you know, water pill, but, you know, I'm supposed to take it at lunch and I eat lunch with my coworkers. And so I can't really do it. And then we would say to the provider, what would you say next? And so one provider might say, well, Mr. Johnson, you just have to take it. So, you know, go to the kitchen sink at your office and take that pill. And then another provider might say, I know this is really hard. I really understand how hard it is. So that was more of an empathetic kind of response. So, so that's how we coded this. And we had three coders doing the coding um, and then came to consensus. So, you know, it was very um, kind of laborious, but extremely well planned as far as, you know, and very well vetted as far as how these cases rolled out. Now, I was actually very surprised that providers really got into this role play. Um, it was wonderful, it was delightful. <laughs> and you did mention that the course itself was about 35 minutes, but I do know that they spent probably what, about an hour in total? An hour, Going through yes. the entire survey. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that really says a lot about people's interest in the topic. Uh, but building on uh, thinking about, uh, 
the case vignettes and how people responded, um, and then connecting it back to the course. Uh, a question that came in is asking if there were maybe specific topics covered during that course that you think was particularly beneficial to educate on. And I think probably putting that in context of like, how which pieces do you think really carried over into those case vignettes, especially given that you didn't necessarily find differences and you found improvements overall in patient communication, regardless of bias. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that, you know, really important was beginning with the history of racism in medicine. This whole course was meant to flow and to help people understand, as well as providing very, very basic knowledge about the history of racism in medicine, which is strong and deep to really understand where some of these vestiges of attitudes might come from. And then going into social determinants of health and, you know, having kind of eliciting uh, empathy among people who may not have really been aware that, you know, where you live really matters. Um, and then moving into what is implicit bias and, you know, helping people understand this is just how our minds work. This is sort of a common condition. And then what can we do as providers to kind of make sure it doesn't impact, you know, how we work. And then people were picking up, you know, one of the ways that implicit bias impacts patient care is when people are overworked, tired, when there's ambig ambiguity about the treatment plan. So people were picking up on that. And we saw in the reflection that I, you know, kind of read that, you know, somebody was, well, I'm going to be more attentive to myself when I'm really tired and when I'm, you know, in an ambiguous kind of treatment uh, situation. So there was a lot of room for uptake because it was very, very literature based. So we, we did, you know, what do we know in the literature? What does the literature tell us about bias and, you know, um, disparities? So I think it was very purposeful. And then in these case vignettes, um, we did vary the race by patient race. And we haven't done the analysis yet by patient race to see if there were differences. So that's something that's still pending. Great, and I, I know we just have a couple minutes left here and I don't see any additional questions, but I did wanna give you uh, just a brief moment to talk a little bit about what's next. Uh, so you just talked right now about doing additional analyses by race, but we I know you are leading for us another study looking at the lasting effects of implicit bias. Maybe you can give a quick preview of what, okay. what's to come. Yeah, so I feel like the luckiest researcher on earth because I was given the opportunity to then go back to this group of providers. I did include that in the consent form originally, can we come back to you in a year, which I think if anybody's doing research, that's always a good idea to put in there because you just never know. And so we did um, go back and we just have finished wrapping up the uh, data collection for that project. And we were asking, again, bias awareness. So we have something to compare to. We were asking about uh, reflections on teaching and practice. We asked people, do you remember the course at all? And some people didn't, <laughs> but you know, how does this fit into, again, the most incredible tumultuous year of 2020? So, you know, people, we ask them, you know, has this impacted how you treat patients during COVID? And so we've had this wonderful opportunity and we haven't had a chance yet to really analyze the data, but, you know, it will be coming. And so it's very fortunate to be able to go back a year later, especially given the year we had. And, you know, just anecdotally, what we're hearing is, you know, this was just one piece of many, many things we were asked to do this year and, you know, people getting involved in their diversity committees and people getting involved in their institutional anti-racism efforts. And so we're hearing these kind of things. And of course it isn't only the course, but it's one part of the picture. So that's you know, great, very Janet. exciting. Yeah. Yes, I'm very grateful for the leadership that you've taken on this work. And I thank HRSA, especially the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis yeah. for supporting this work. I want to turn it over to David and thank all the audience really for your participation and questions. But David, I'll let you close us out. Well, thank you, Bianca. You did a wonderful job moderating. And, and thank you, Janice. That was a great presentation and very timely, very timely. <laughs> And for those of you in the audience, uh, we did record this presentation. It will be available on our website within a couple of weeks. Generally, we get it 
within one week. And also we'll have like additional resources there like slides, link to the course, et cetera. So once more, wonderful presentation. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for attending and I hope to see you again in the near future. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.